Hello everyone, Ryan Jackson here. Hope you're doing well. Today is August 2nd, 2022, and it gives me a great deal of pleasure to let you know that I finished writing the 2023 Code Changes book last week. should be available to purchase in uh, early October of 2022. Now, the NEC itself will probably be available to purchase the first or second week of September. Now, the code book is not completely finished yet, because there are some last-minute uh, appeals that could end up taking place. I don't think any of them are going to be successful, but one never knows. So the 2023 codebook is quite literally 99.9% .9 finished. Uh, again, there, there are a couple of small things that could change, and I'm, I'm not going to touch on any of the things that could possibly change at this point. I just want to talk about the things that are, that are set in stone and will, in fact, be in the 2023 code. And why not start with GFCI protection? That seems to be an issue that is always changing, and it always results in a lot of discussion and strong feelings that we have. So let's go ahead and get into the first video covering the 2023 code changes with 210.8 GFCI protection. Let's go. All right. So every three years since 1968, we have added GFCI requirements into the code, and this edition is no different. Uh, we did add some GFCI protection requirements for residential and commercial. This is going to be limited to 210.8, which is branch circuits. I'm not going to get into specific things like, uh, like swimming pools or electric vehicle chargers, elevator equipment rooms, things like that. I want to start this out with the, with the buildings that we wire every day, just you know the dwelling units and the non-dwelling units as it relates to receptacles and some other outlets in 210.8F. So, the rules for GFCI protection were expanded here in 210.8. Let's take a look at how they were changed. 210.8 starts out by saying this. GFCI protection has to be provided as required in 210.8A through F. The GFCI device, the test and reset button, has to be in a readily accessible location. Okay, now that hasn't changed since I think 2008 or so. Do we need to provide GFCI protection for the receptacle at the garage door opener in the garage? Yes, we do. Can you put the test and reset button up there on the ceiling? No, you cannot, because that would not be readily accessible. You need to get a portable ladder to get to it. And according to Article 100, that means it's not readily accessible. Now, the fact that the receptacle is not readily accessible does not remove the requirement for protection. It still has to be GFCI protected. You just can't put the test and reset button at that location. So you might have to have it in a, on a GFCI circuit breaker or an upstream GFCI receptacle. Again, that didn't change. How do we measure for GFCI protection? Well, up until the 2017 code, we didn't tell you. It simply said, you know, <laughs> if the rule said you need GFCI protection for receptacles within six feet of a sink, it was just kind of expected that you knew what that meant. And I think most of us thought that we did. I mean, uh, it says within six feet of a sink. Well, what does that mean? Well, what do you think it means, dummy? <laughs> six feet of a sink. Okay, well, what about in this picture here? Here I've got my bathroom sink. Now, I know that the receptacles in the bathroom have to be GFCI. I get that. But what about this receptacle that's not in the bathroom, but is within six feet of the sink? How do I measure? Do I, just, do I measure with a tape? Do I measure straight through the wall? Do I measure you know, as a cord would go through the door? Do I measure through a door? Does the measurement stop at doors? So it's not as simple as one would think. Now, in the 2017 code, we expressed how to measure. And we said, look, for GFCI protection, the distance is the shortest path that a supply cord would take without piercing a floor, wall, ceiling, or fixed barrier. Now, in the 2017, it also said without going through a door. Well, that was kind of problematic. I mean, who's to prevent a person from plugging something in at this receptacle? and putting it by the sink or dropping it in the sink. You know, maybe you've got the receptacle near the bathroom sink is completely consumed. You've got your hair dryer and curling iron and everything else plugged in it. And maybe you want to plug something else in there and put it on the countertop and it falls in the drink. You know, stranger things have happened. So we measure through doors. That was added in the 2017. They took it out in the 2020 because it didn't make sense. So we, we still continue the measurement through a door. That didn't change, all right? That was in the 2020. It's in the 2023. 
When we remove words from the code, it's a little bit hard to see them. When we add words in the code, it's simple. They jump off the page because NFPA is kind and they highlight what the words are. But when we remove words, it's kind of hard to see. So if you look down here on the bottom right, right after the word barrier, I put an underline under the period because we actually removed some words. Remember in the 2017 code, I said that the GFCI distance is the shortest length that a cord would take in, with, uh, that a cord would take without piercing a floor, wall, ceiling, fixed barrier, or going through a door or a window. In the 2020, we took the language about doors out, but we left the language about windows. And where I'm going here is this. What about this receptacle here on this wall? This is an unusual scenario. So. Visualize this. This room back here is the kitchen. You can see the microwave. And as I'm doing the dishes, I can look through that hole in the wall and watch TV. Now, what is this hole in the wall? Well, you could easily argue that that's a window. Uh, I'm not certain that a window necessarily has to have glass. So if I'm standing in here doing the dishes, my hands are in the dishes, I'm looking straight through watching TV, does this receptacle require GFCI protection. Well, can you plug something into it with a six-foot cord, chuck it through that hole in the wall, and will it land in the sink? If the answer is yes, then it needs GFCI protection because for the 2023 code, we are continuing the measurement through a window. Now, how often does this really come up? Probably not very. So this isn't that substantial of a change. Before, we didn't measure through windows. Now we do. Okay, fine. Let's get into the, the real changes here. Dwelling units, 210.8a, dwelling unit receptacles. Uh, nothing really changed here as far as the introductory text, all 125 through 250 volt receptacles, supplied by a single phase branch circuit rated 150 volts or less to ground, must be GFCI protected if they're located in the following locations. All right, so this was a change in the 2020 code. Historically, when we talked about GFCI protection uh, for receptacles in dwellings, we were talking about these guys on the left, 125 volt, 15 and 20 amp receptacles. For the 2020 code, they changed that to include 250 volt receptacles. If supplied by a single phase branch circuit rated 150 volts or less to ground. Now, a lot of people look at this and they say, well, Ryan, let that dryer receptacle is a 240 volt circuit. I understand that. What's the rating of the circuit measured from line to ground? It's 120, not 240. And this says, look, if the circuit is rated 150 or volts or less to ground, then you need GFCI protection. So yes, it does apply to the laundry receptacle, to the dryer. It might also uh, apply to a welder in the garage, for example, or an RV receptacle on the outside of the house, right? A 125 volt, 30 amp receptacle. So 125 through 250 volt receptacles rated 150 volts or less to ground in the following locations. Now I underlined in the following locations because it used to say in the location specified in A1 through A6 and then it was A8 and then it was A10 and finally they just said, you know, why, why are we doing this? Why do we keep on just adding numbers when we could just say in the following locations? So that's what they did. No, uh, no real change there. What changed in residential? As far as receptacles go, not a lot, if I'm being honest. Not as much as a lot of people would think. The first change happened here in A6, and that's for kitchens. GFCI protection is required for receptacles in the kitchen. Okay, so this used to say it's required for the receptacles in the kitchen that serve the countertops. So the countertop receptacles needed GFCI protection. Now we're saying that all receptacles in the kitchen need GFCI protection. Now, is that increasing a lot of GFCI requirements? Potentially. And the reason I say that is the receptacle under the sink for the, for the dishwasher and disposal, for the, di for the disposal, I should say, the receptacle for the disposal probably already required GFCI protection. It's within six feet of the sink, right? It, it's right under the sink, so it already required it. What about the receptacle here for the microwave above the range? That did not require GFCI protection, but it did require AFCI protection. So if I already have AFCI protection, is it really a big deal to put that on a dual purpose AFCI, GFCI breaker? 
Probably not. I mean, listen, I, it's easy for me to spend your money, and, and I understand it all adds up. I get it. But if it was already on an AFCI, and now it just needs to be on an AFCI slash GFCI, it's probably not adding that much cost. And to be honest, I know in a lot of areas, they already were doing it because it's like, eh, you know, it's just easier to buy a whole bunch of AFCI, GFCI dual function breakers and put them on that way. So that's probably not a huge change. Now, what about the range? That's kind of the, the gorilla in the corner of the room, if you will. Well, in some applications, this was already required under the 2020 code because if the range receptacle was within six feet of the sink, then you needed to have GFCI protection already. Now, that probably wasn't often the case, but it is now. So now the range has to be GFCI protected, assuming, of course, that it's cord and plug connected. Uh, there were some dead bodies that drove that change. Um, one that comes to mind was, uh, was a plumber that was doing some work and got electrocuted on the range. Um, sometimes with, uh, with ranges, the heating elements, when they, when they reach their end of life, they can energize the frame and result in a shock hazard. You know, a, a properly installed range with an equipment grounding conductor hopefully would solve that problem, but not always. You know, there was a, there was a recall done on a bunch of ranges that came from the factory wired incorrectly, and, uh, and they were tripping GFCIs and come to find out that they were tripping the GFCIs because they were a shock hazard. And there was a recall done and they ended up having to rewire the, the ranges and that was a good thing. You know, it, it ended up saving people's lives, the fact that they were on the GFCI. So we need GFCI protection for all receptacles in the kitchen, not just the countertops and not just the ones within six feet of the sink. The other thing that changed for residential and Again, this, this might not be much of a change at all, really, <clears throat> is for wet bars and similar. So under the 2020 code, the 2017, the 2014, what was the requirement when it came to a wet bar? Well, it was the receptacles within six feet of the sink. Now it says you need GFCI protection for receptacles in areas with sinks and permanent provisions for cooking or preparing food and drinks. So I, I say wet bars, the code just says, you know, sink and permanent provisions for cooking or preparing food or drinks. So I don't have permanent provisions for cooking here, but I do have permanent provisions for preparing food. So all receptacles in that area need to be GFCI protected. Okay, well, what's an area? I don't know. <laughs> an area, that's something that the, that the AHJ is going to have to define. Now, you may hate that. You might say, well, I, I wish it said room. Well, not so fast. I mean, you, you want it to say room? Look at the picture here. You want every single receptacle in the entire room? Probably not. Does it just mean within six feet of the sink? Uh, you could argue that. You know, what about this receptacle over here in the back on the top left? Is that within six feet of the sink? Mm, probably not. Is that in the area? with a sink and permanent provisions for cooking and preparing food or drinks, it looks like it. So I'm gonna say that that requires GFCI protection. I think that's in the same area. So the wet bar area, the area with a sink and permanent provisions for preparing food and drink. They added an exception in 210.8a and it's one of those where it's like, you know, you, I don't think this was a requirement anyway, but I understand the argument. So you had some inspectors saying, listen, this is an exhaust fan. And yeah, if you, if you open your exhaust fan, it's going to look just as nasty as this one. They get dusty and all sorts of stuff. So the exhaust fan has a little two wire, I don't even want to say cord, because it's like two wires that go to an attachment plug and it plugs into a thing. Because I really don't want to call it a receptacle either. But some inspectors look at it and they say, listen, dude, that's a receptacle. And I mean, I guess I get it, kind of. Um, it, it's an appliance, but does that mean that the appliance couldn't have a receptacle inside of it? I don't know. So you had some inspectors saying, listen, that's a receptacle. It's in the bathroom. You need GFCI protection. Maybe those people were right. Maybe they were wrong. But here's the thing. The, the argument is gone. So there's an exception that says, okay, factory installed receptacles that are an internal part of an exhaust fan do not require GFCI protection unless required by the listing or the instructions of the unit. Okay, so 
right off the bat we're saying listen you do not need to have gfci protection for the exhaust fan it's not required and i think that's a good clarification but it also brings up a discussion point do the instructions ever actually require gfci protection and the answer to that is surprisingly yes they do uh, this is from ul's website uh, ul product iq by the way, if you don't have UL Product IQ, I say you haven't. I mean, it's a website. Everybody has it. But if, you're, if you haven't created a username and password, you need to. UL Product IQ is a free resource, and it has a massive amount of information. So I went to UL Product IQ. I searched for exhaust fans, and I wanted to find the listing requirements for exhaust fans. So this comes from the product standard. If I send my, my exhaust fan to UL or Intertech or CSA or whoever to, to get it listed, they're going to read a product standard and they're going to make sure that your product complies with the requirements of the standard. Well, the standard says this. Ceiling fans, dot, 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 acceptable for use over a bathtub or shower when installed with a GFCI protected circuit are intended for use anywhere within a bathroom ceiling surface, including over the tub, shower, etc. If we scroll down here a little farther, it says products without that marking are intended for use anywhere within a bathroom ceiling surface except the area directly above the footprint of the bathtub or shower. Okay, so if I'm installing an exhaust fan over the shower or over the bathtub, then it has to be marked acceptable for use over a bathtub or shower. And it has to be GFCI protected. Now, that's not a code change. That's part of the instructions of the equipment. So do I need to have GFCI protection for my ceiling fan in my bathroom? The answer is usually not, but if it's installed directly over the bathtub or shower, then it does. And it has to be marked suitable for installation in that location. All right, so those are the changes for dwelling units in 210.8a. So 210.8b, other than dwelling units, GFCI protection, all 125 through 250 volt receptacles supplied by branch circuits, rated 150 volts or less to ground and 50 amps or less, and three-phase branch circuits rated 150 volts or less to ground and 100 amps or less, must be GFCI protected if they're installed in any of the following locations. Okay, so that part did not change. The introductory text as to what types of receptacles require GFCI protection. So we added a couple of locations and we revised a couple other ones. Let's take a peek at where we need GFCI protection for other than dwelling units in the 2023. All right, so buffet serving areas with permanent provisions for cooking or preparing food or drinks. Now I'm showing like a buffet serving area where you've got all of your food and you've got some heating uh, devices in there to keep the food warm. So I go through there, I, I get my chow and I take it back to my table and I gobble it up. That would be a buffet serving area, but let's take a peek. Does that have permanent provisions for cooking? No. Does it have permanent provisions for preparing food or drinks? I don't think so. I, I don't think putting the food onto your plate is preparing food. I think preparing is actually, you know, creating the food and not just putting it on your plate. So at first glance, this code change seems to be somewhat significant. I mean, it, obviously it's not every restaurant that has a buffet serving area, but it's even smaller when you really read the words kind of with a magnifying glass. So buffet serving areas, but only if they have permanent provisions for cooking or preparing food or drinks. So if uh, I, I know I've, I've seen uh, buffet areas where like a guy is cutting, uh, cutting roast beef and he serves it and puts it on your plate. Is that preparing food? I don't know. Is it just cutting food? I, I think you can make the argument. Uh, but I think it requires a little bit more equipment than just what we have here. So this change kind of jumps off the page as, as being kind of a big new item. But upon further review, I don't think it's that big of a deal. This is a, a pretty big expansion. And, and this is something that is always kind of an interesting discussion. So sinks, when the receptacles or the cord and plug connected fixed or stationary appliances are installed within six feet of the top inside edge of the sink's bowl. All right, so here we've got our sink over here, and we've got a receptacle that's within six feet. It looks like it's very close. 
if that receptacle was within six feet of the sink, then it required GFCI protection under the 2020 code. Let's, let's move it over six inches to the right, and let's say, okay, you know what, it's not within six feet. But the appliance that it's supplying is within six feet. Well, let's be honest here for a minute. How long are your arms? <laughs> what, what's the shock hazard here? Do I have my fingers in the sink and my other arm touching the receptacle? Is that really what's shocking you? Or is it the equipment that's plugged into the receptacle? It's probably the equipment that's plugged in. So it makes sense to measure it to the connected equipment. Now, the problem with that is during inspection. When I'm inspecting a building, I can see the receptacle, and I can see the sink, and I can measure them. It's a little bit more difficult to, to know exactly what's being plugged in, how large that equipment is going to be, and how do I measure it if the equipment's not there. But if it's fixed or stationary appliances like this, uh, I don't know, what is this, a drink maker of some sort it looks like? Or an ice mag? It's an ice maker. So if that's in place during the inspection, then I can look at it and say, okay, well that appliance is within six feet of the sink, so that needs to have GFCI protection. So this makes sense from a theory perspective because it, it really is the appliance that's, that's providing the shock. It's not the receptacle itself. So this could be a, a pretty substantial change. It definitely increases the footprint of where GFCI protection is required. It has the potential of being problematic during the inspection because I don't know what type of equipment or where that equipment and, and how big it is. So, you know, it could result in some, in some arguments in the field, hopefully not, but there you go. So not just the receptacles, but the equipment. Item 8 was revised, and I, I think most people didn't catch this. You know, I'll be honest with you. I, I, find, I found myself saying this sentence before it was actually in the code. GFCI protection is required for receptacles in indoor, damp, or wet locations. Well, it didn't say that in the 2020 code. It said indoor, damp, and wet locations. Well, you can't have a location that's both damp and wet. It's one or the other. So it used to say damp and wet. Now it says damp or wet. I mean, that give me a break. That's what it meant to say all along. So here I've got kind of this, uh, this indoor garden and you can see down here I've got a hose, we spray it with water every day. That would be, at a minimum, an indoor damp location. Potentially an indoor wet location, you know, you, you could debate that. But either way, it does scream for GFCI protection, and it's definitely required. <clears throat> nice. It's required. <clears throat> Alright, new one, item 13. Aquariums, bait wells, and similar open aquatic containers if the receptacle is within six feet of the top inside edge or rim or from the conductive surfaces that support it. Okay, this sounds like a big deal because we're adding GFCI protection requirements and that, that's always kind of a big issue, but how often do you really see an open aquarium in other than dwelling units? I mean, honestly, how often do you see an aquarium? in a commercial establishment. Not, not that often. Uh, this is a friend of mine. He's really into, into uh, saltwater fish and he put an aquarium in his office. And that's cool looking. Does that mean this receptacle down here needs GFCI protection? Well, if I read it closely, it says aquariums, bait wells, and similar open aquatic containers. So I think you have to be able to basically touch the water in order for this to apply. So if we have an open aquarium, then we need GFCI protection for receptacles within six feet of the top inside edge where the actual water is or from conductive surfaces supporting it. So if I had like a metal, uh, metal framework supporting that and the aquarium was open, then you would need to have GFCI protection. This seems like a pretty reasonable uh, requirement. Again, it's not something that's going to come up too terribly often, but there you go. All right, let's talk about 210.8F, outdoor outlets at dwellings. So this was added in the 2020 code. Without a doubt, this was the most controversial code change in the 2020 code, and, and perhaps the most controversial code change uh, since I've been around playing this code game. And that was outdoor outlets at dwellings. So basically, we added GFCI protection for 
outdoor equipment at dwellings and that would include air conditioners and that was where all of the controversy came in um, there are some air conditioning units that are not compatible with GFCI protection and it's a problem it, it is and it was a, a, a hotly debated issue there were multiple attempts at what we call a tentative interim amendment to change it in the middle of the code cycle and one was even successful so there was a TIA issued saying, okay, for, air, for certain air conditioners, mini split units, this comes into effect in 2023 because there were units that were not working. You plug the, you turn them on and they were tripping the GFCI. And that would drive a person crazy where I live in, in Salt Lake City, Utah, where it can get, you know, 102, 103 in Phoenix or in Las Vegas or in Southern Utah, where it gets 120. Uh, you can have dead bodies <laughs> you know, as a result of an air conditioner not coming on. So this was a major problem. And they, they talked about it and they made some changes, but they made some expansions for this requirement for the 2023. So let's take a look at what it says. Outdoor outlets, including those in the following locations, must be GFCI protected if they're supplied by branch circuits rated 150 volts to ground or 50 amps, uh, 150 volts to ground or less, and 50 amps or less. All right, so we need to talk about the definition of outlet. Outlet is defined as a point on the premises wiring system where current is taken to supply utilization equipment. Hardwired equipment ends at an outlet, assuming that that equipment is utilization equipment. All right, so if I have an outdoor water heater, not something you're going to see in my area, but in some parts of the country, they will put their water heaters outdoors. And if they hardwire the water heater, is that a point on the premises wiring system? Yes. Is current taken at that location? Yes. Does it supply utilization equipment? Yes. That's an outlet. Same thing with your air conditioner. We can debate whether it's the disconnect or whether it's the unit itself or in my opinion it's where the conductors leave the conduit and terminate to the air conditioner in my opinion that's the outlet point but without any doubt an air conditioner is supplied by an outlet there is no question there is no debate whatsoever about that fact so outdoor outlets have to have GFCI protection 150 volts to ground or less, 50 amps or less. All right, so this air conditioner needs to be GFCI protected, assuming it's 50 amps or less, just like an outdoor water heater. And again, that didn't really change. GFCI protection is not required for snow melting, de-icing, or pipeline slash vessel heating equipment. All right, so depending on where you live, you may be looking at this with some raised eyebrows and confusion. This is heat tape. All right, so this is something that we stuff inside of the drain pipes and we put over the roof and we put it through the rain gutter to basically melt the snow to prevent ice damming and, and structural damage to the building. So this is what we call heat tape. And this does not have to have GFCI protection, but it does have to have GFPE protection. So don't think you're off the hook. So it says GFCI protection is not required for that. Yeah, that's true, but you still need GFPE protection. So you need to have GFCI, GFCI protection for outdoor equipment other than heat tape. Where? Well, outdoors at dwellings and outdoors at dwellings at garages because the, <clears throat> the garage isn't a dwelling, right? The garage is a garage. Okay, fine, but it, it, it's at the dwelling. It's just not part of the dwelling. So over here on the left, if this is my dwelling, then this would be my detached garage, and this over here would be an accessory building, maybe a boathouse. All of those now, outdoor outlets, had to have GFCI protection. That's probably not that big of an expansion. I think most people were looking at the rule in 210.8F and said, yeah, it, it probably meant to apply there. I think a lot of people figured it did because it said outdoor dwellings and a lot of people just incorporate all of that as part of the dwelling. So not a huge expansion there, but an expansion nonetheless. Nonetheless, They also made a clarification to say if equipment in these locations is replaced, then the outlet for the equipment must be GFCI protected as well. Now, I'm showing a rooftop here with a bunch of air conditioners. And the reason I'm showing that is because this is a multifamily dwelling. This is an apartment building. 
Are apartments dwellings? Yes, this rule applies to dwellings, not just one and two family dwellings, but dwellings. So if I had to replace any of these air conditioners, then I would have to provide GFCI protection, right? Whether it's a one family, two family, or multifamily, if you're replacing outdoor equipment at a dwelling, then you need to provide GFCI protection. And we still have the same exception that we had in the 2020, and that is for lighting outlets. So this receptacle outlet requires GFCI protection. If I had outdoor hardwired equipment like an air conditioner or a water heater or something like that, it would require GFCI protection. But the lighting outlet does not because we have an exception that specifically omits those. That didn't change. And then this is the uh, tentative interim amendment that was issued. And I know that the, that the writing is too small to read here, but the intent here is just to show you that there was a tentative interim, interim amendment issued back in, uh, when did they issue that? Last, uh, oh, right there, September 15th of 2021. It says, this requirement shall become effective on January 1st of 2023 for mini split type heating, ventilating, air conditioning, HVAC equipment and other HVAC units employing power conversion equipment as a means to control compressor speed. So if your, if your HVAC equipment, your, your heating, air conditioning equipment has, a, has an adjustable speed drive, then you do not have to have GFCI protection for it until January 1st of 2023. Now that's assuming that your jurisdiction knows about this tentative interim amendment and accepts it. You know, this TIA, it, it, it's not necessarily part of the code. This was issued after the code was written. We, we can, you know, once a, once a city adopts a code, a city or state adopts the code, then that's what they adopted. If we come in later and fix the code and say, oh man, we made a mistake, this is what we meant. The city doesn't have to accept that. They can say, hey, listen, Jack, so what? You made a mistake, you made the bed, you sleep in it. We're not accepting this tentative interim amendment most jurisdictions are going to accept the TIA. They're going to look at it and say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll allow kind of, uh, we'll, we'll allow that to, to change what we adopted because obviously there's a reason why NFPA put out this tentative interim amendment because it is a problem. So most areas are going to defer to the TIA and allow people to not install GFCI protection for HVA split, for HVAC mini split units with power conversion equipment. But for everything else, it's already a requirement. All right, there you go. There's your changes in 210.8 for the 2023 NEC. Thanks, everybody. Be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and ring the bell.